When he was growing up, his first interest was chemistry. At the age of six, he had learned to make gunpowder. But by the age of 12, he had had so many accidents that he decided to change his interest from chemistry to music. He's Frank Zappa. And ever since 1967, he has left an explosive trail of music that has had one constant throughout, biting social commentary. His no-holds-barred sense of humor even includes ridiculing his own audience. Frank Zappa has been acclaimed as a genius for his versatility and consistently fine art under many different guises. Composer, band leader, movie producer, musician, and record company executive. He is my guest this evening. I am, I must admit, I was rather surprised to see you in a very traditional, conventional navy blue suit and tie. A navy blue suit with kind of a pink shirt, though. Uh, does that make that it all right? Better, yeah. <laughs> I expected you to uh, come in in some sort of bizarre outfit, and you look so businesslike and so... Uh, I'm a businesslike kind of a guy. You are? Yeah. People don't think of you as a businesslike kind of guy. Well, there's a good reason for that, because the only thing that they know about me is things that they have read or things that other people tell them about me. Mm -hmm. Since nobody ever gets to see me up close, you know, I'm always brought to you secondhand, right. and the attitudes of the people who report my activities tend to color the way in which I'm reported. So what should they know about you? I mean, here's the opportunity for Frank Zappa to tell people what he's really like, so that they're not surprised when they see you appear in a, a navy blue conservative suit. Well, I'm a person with uh, common sense, mm -hmm. basically, who does a uh, certain type of art. Common sense, to me, that's always been very important. I mean, I see a lot of people in this country without it. Uh, yeah. I also, I mean, when I was being raised, my well, mother... I mean, they have them in other countries, too. That's true. We won't just lay the blame on this country. My mom always uh, instilled in me common sense. She said, I don't care what else you do in life. If you just use your head and you think things out, you'll be okay. I think that was terrific advice. Where did, uh, where did you learn common sense? Or is that something you think you're just born with? No, I got it by accident. You know, <laughs> yes. uh, my parents did not necessarily bang me over the head and say, now listen, common sense is really good because, uh, well, they were sensible people, but they weren't advocating it all the time. You know, I just learned it by accident. Some of the things, though, that you did when you were a teenager uh, didn't seem to show a whole lot of common sense. I mean, you got into a lot of trouble when you were in high school. And well, it's possible to get into trouble in an organized institution simply by being different than the rest of the people in the institution. And uh, if um, a person gets into trouble, that does not necessarily mean that that person is bad. Mm-hmm. What about, tell me about some of the different things that happened in high school. Well, I managed to graduate uh, with about 20 units less than what you were supposed to have because I'd been thrown out so many times. And one of the reasons why I was thrown out is because when I was a senior in high school and my uh, younger brother was a freshman, he was kind of sexually assaulted by one of the shop teachers during a class. And I found out about this uh, during uh, the break between classes and immediately went over there and held this particular shop teacher at bay with a, a wood-turning chisel and a pair of tin snips and, you know, did blackboard jungle on this guy and uh, until the dean of men came in and took me away. You know, but mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't like to stand for um, people pushing me around or pushing my relatives around, you know, and I, I get very upset about things like that. It's so, interesting. So they threw me out of school. It's interesting, though, that when that incident is brought up, and I believe it was mentioned briefly, uh, some reference to it in a People magazine article. It isn't brought up why you did that. It's only, it only is brought up what you did, and no one knew the reason behind that. I mean, I think if anyone, as they are hearing the reason now, they would say you were well within your rights to do something like no, that. No, I think I was well within my rights to go in there and do something like that, but I also think that what happened to me in school was a result of the kind of stupidity that is prevalent in schools in a small town. If you have somebody in the school who is different than the local norm. And uh, we were discussing this before, that without deviation from the norm, progress is not possible. I think the norm is fine. You want to be a normal kind of a guy, you want to drink beer, uh, watch sports on television, and do all that kind of stuff, do it. If that makes you happy, you should. Mm -hmm. But if you have other ideas about ways to improve things, new inventions, some new kind of art, whatever it is that you want to do, in a free society, you should be free to let your mind 
developed to its fullest and you should receive support from the community for doing this because ultimately what you do as a creative person is going to benefit the rest of the so-called normal people in the community. All right, now you've had the freedom to do those things. I don't know if you've always felt that you've had the support. Well, you, when you say the freedom to do those things, certain things can only be fully executed with finances. You know, if you have an idea for an invention, for instance, uh, and you need the uh, tools or the machinery to build the thing, you may have the, the freedom to think it up, but you don't have the financial freedom to construct it. Mm -hmm. And same goes with artistic projects. You might have a great idea for an opera, but you're not going to be able to mount your opera unless you have enough money to pay off all the unions that have come in to ruin the, uh, the situation for the arts the way it is in America today. You know, I'm sure there are a lot of people that are listening and hear you say that remark about the unions. And in the context in which you use it, you said the unions that come in to ruin. They do ruin it. Absolutely. I think that that's one of the worst things that's happened to America today is the way in which unions of all descriptions have affected the quality of life in the United States. And the way that unions are represented on television and the PR organizations that they pay and that they have going for them try and perpetuate the myth that America is a unionized country and when something wrong happens, the unions are there to sort of fight for that underdog working guy. And maybe in the beginning when there was a certain type of oppression in the workplace, the unions did come in and help um, support the viewpoint of the working underdog but what they have turned into is these vast organizations that take money from poor working guys invest it in shady deals and don't really help the working people while still feeding them these fantasies that if you all stop working and go on a strike then we'll be able to get more money for you and your paycheck but all that does is uh, make the guy that they're working for raise the price of the goods that he's manufacturing and then everybody else bites the bag but in the case of the arts I see situations all the time where stagehands unions are paid incredible amounts of money for doing nothing and in many instances uh, degrading the quality of the, the live shows that they're associated with I see uh, people who are in executive positions in unions thinking up regulations that don't really fit with the way uh, the craft is being run like in the musicians union for instance in um, certain aspects of the television business. And you're a member of the musicians union. I am a member of the musicians union. And it makes me feel kind of strange to have to say bad things about a union that I belong to, but I'm forced to join that union because of the way the uh, business operates. And I'm forced to do business with other unions as I travel around and play live shows. But that does not mean that I should keep my mouth shut about the way that they operate. Many of them operate by extortion and they subject the touring groups to regulations that are ridiculous. And you say many of them result to, uh, in, in extortion. What do you mean by that? Well, let's say you want to go to a place and you want to uh, do a live recording at a hall. A guy from the union will come up to you in some places and say, you can't uh, turn your recording equipment on unless you pay us, say, $3,000. And you say, for what? Oh, for extra union fees. For what? Well, because we have to pay this uh, special rate for these men who are standing around here. Well, for what? Well, that's just what the union says. And if you don't pay, we'll stop the show. Would they do that? Oh, yeah. Sure they would. Have you paid? Some instances, if I think the show is important enough to record and there is no recourse, I will pay. Other, instrument, other instances, I don't pay and I don't record. And this happened to us last year in Chicago when we were working there. They wanted to stick us with a $3,000 bill. I mean, the, the workmen who are at the hall are doing no extra work. I supply all the labor for this recording because it's my recording equipment. I supply all the equipment and the manpower. Why should I have to pay an extra fee to a bunch of guys who are sitting around who care nothing about what I'm doing, will do nothing to help the quality of it, or not putting in an extra second of work or an extra ounce of muscle power, why should I be bribing them? And it's not just mm -hmm. Chicago. There are other cities where... Do they give happens. you a receipt when you give them that kind of money? I'm not the one who actually has to shake hands with them and hand them the check. This is something that's done by the road manager. Mm -hmm. I presume that there is a piece of paper that changes hands when, when the money... I presume that there is a piece of paper that changes hands when, when the money is uh, exchanged. I, I think probably a lot of people hearing you talk about this they can understand your frustration 
But it, on the other hand, to say that, to speak out against unions can be considered by some to be almost un-American. It's not un-American. Remember that not all of America is unionized. The vast majority of Americans are not unionized. But if there were no unions, like you said, maybe in the beginning they needed the unions, but now they've evolved into something else. But if the unions were taken away, maybe it would return to the way it was in the beginning and you would have children working in the I'm not saying take the away. I, I, I would not suggest that at all. What I'm saying is that honesty is the best policy. And honesty in all forms of American business is totally down the tubes right now. It's its lowest ebb in history. How do you get it back? Well, first of all, you have to create a desire for it to be there. And uh, when you have political leaders who do not demonstrate honesty, when you have people lying to you constantly on television, on the radio, in the movies, it's all a lie, and everybody just gets used to the lie as a way of life, then honesty as a concept is, is very uh, outmoded and archaic, and nobody wants to be an honest guy anymore, because if you're honest, then you're going to finish last, you know, the good guy's finishing last. And this is bad. I just think that it's disgusting. I'm 40 years old. I remember when there used to be a little honesty around. What, don't you think there still is? I mean, don't you uh, think? Not I mean, don't you dangerous. consider yourself an honest person? Yeah, but I'm not in a position where I can do anything to influence anybody. And don't you think there are honest people who are in some of those other areas? You mentioned politics, you mentioned uh, movies, you mentioned the television, the media. There's always exceptions to the rule, but I would say, and without batting an eye, that the rule today is dishonesty is the rule and honesty is the exception. See, I would hate to believe that. You can hate to believe it, but if you don't believe it, you're a fool. You think so? I, see, I think, yes, in every instance that you have mentioned, in every area, I think that there are a few people who perhaps are not totally honest, or who perhaps are not honest at all, uh, who are dishonest. I don't think that's the norm, though. I mean, If you're talking strictly about quantity of people being honest versus quantity of people being dishonest, maybe you could come up with a statistic balance mm -hmm. that would show that maybe 51 or 52 percent of the people are honest and 48 are shady. But the few that really control things are not honest, and they count for more votes than the extra ones who might be honest. Do you know what I mean? I know what you're saying, but who would those people be? I don't think we have an honest president. I don't think that he is surrounded by honest people. I don't think that most of the people in Congress or, or in the Senate are honest. I don't believe that they are honest people. And why do you say that? What makes you believe that? I think the, the proof of that is the way the country operates. And I don't think that most of the people who head up businesses are honest. See, I would hate to, to feel that negative. I mean, I realize that un unless you open your eyes to a situation as it really is, you can't do anything about changing it. But I would hate to be that negative, that pessimistic about uh, the shape of this country and the shape of the people in this country. You would hate to be that negative and be right. Yes. That's what would really be horrible. Now, if you could be that negative and somebody would suddenly just come up with all the proof and say, it's really okay, you're just a negative kind of a person. You know, that would be like a cute little dream for a minute mm -hmm. there. But I believe that I'm right. I believe they are dishonest. I believe we have allowed them to be, to be the way that they are. We have voted them in. We got them in there and we're letting them do it because we're not honest enough to face up to the fact that we are owned and operated by a bunch of really bad people. All right, then, then let's just say that what you're saying is true. I don't totally agree with it, but Let's okay, say that's it all right. Is true. You're a nice person, so you don't. <laughs> all right. Thank you. <laughs> My mother thanks you. Let's say it is true. Okay. What do honest people do to change it? I don't know whether they can. You know, that's what really sounds pessimistic. Yes, I, it does. You know, I don't know. Fatalistic. Almost. No, it's not fatalistic. I mean, you can try, but I don't know whether or not the the effort will yield results. What do you do? I mean, if you are feeling all of these things. How are you able to get out of bed the next day if you are feeling that things are this bad in this country? Well, I do what I do because I love to do it. You know, I'm dedicated to music and I get up and I do my music and I do it my way and I try not to compromise. Mm -hmm. And if I get a chance to go on television and say this, then I do that too. Yeah. And other than that, what else can I do? You know? 
Yeah. I'm not about to march around the street with a sign in my hand. That doesn't do anything. But you can remind people that something's wrong because the tendency today is to just gloss over it. You know, the, 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 the desire for escapist activities is really at quite a peak now. And media likes to uh, accommodate that desire. And th the more you can escape from how horrible things really are, the less it's going to bother you, and then the worse things get. We have to break away for just a moment, or things will get pretty bad around here. I know that. Yes, we have to uh, have a few commercials. We'll do that. We'll come back and we'll continue this conversation with Frank Zappa. Stay with us. <laughs> Welcome back. My guest this evening is Frank Zappa. He has been called outspoken. Uh, it has been said that his music uh, shows biting social commentary. And I think uh, even in the first segment already, I've been able to, to realize that you have definite feelings, strong feelings about things, and you want people to know how you feel about them, and you want them to take you seriously. Well, it's not that critical that they take me seriously. It's just so they don't ignore it completely. You know, just think about it for a minute. Mm -hmm. Have you ever found yourself in trouble because of, uh, I, I know one time there was a lawsuit that was uh, lodged against you because of uh, the words uh, in one of your songs. How often has There's that happened? There's never been a lawsuit lodged against me against because of the words in any of my songs. But what, didn't the uh, Jewish uh, Defamation League? The Anti-Defamation Anti League, which is a P PR organization, made a bunch of noise in the newspapers and about else. a libel suit but there was never was any libel suit there was none it mm -hmm. was pure nothing it was just a bunch of noise there was no legal action and over what song did that occur a song called jewish princess what did they object to um i don't understand what they objected to because first of all the song is journalistic it, re it reports the existence of a phenomenon called a jewish princess which I think is fairly reasonable to do since they do exist. And in the song, it tells what are the characteristics that makes a person a Jewish princess. And that's all the song set out to do. And it says in the song that I want one. It wasn't negative, and I don't know what their complaint was, but I'm sure they do. But it just baffles me. They accuse me of being anti-Semitic, which is something that always helps them get coverage in the newspaper. They can scream that so-and-so is anti-Semitic, and they get some, you know, X paragraphs. I'm not and they're wrong and that was two years ago does it bother you when people object to some of your songs um to what point well you're trying let, to get let me problem? tell you the kinds of objections that occur and the types of people who object you know we've already listed the adl that was an organized mechanized kind of objection you know phone calls letter writing pressure campaign that kind of stuff mm -hmm. and it was a media oriented event Sometimes a radio station will get one phone call from one person someplace, one time, who hears one word in one of my songs that manages to get on the radio and screams they're going to the FCC. Instead of the radio station thinking about how many people who are listening to that station at the time love the song, want to hear it again, and will support the station for playing it, because one person called up and said, I'm going to do this, the guy who owns the station panics out and takes my record off the air. That's what I object to. Because the people who are in favor of having me played on the air and uh, like to hear what I do, they never call up and say, yeah, that's great that you're playing Zappa well, on the air. Well, when people feel strongly about something, usually when people feel strongly about something in a negative way, they're more apt to write or call. Right, but see, if, if the station, who is only interested in making money, only hears negative things, then their only response is going to be to avoid confrontation with yes. uh, this particular force in the community. Even if it's a crotchety little old lady sitting around someplace who doesn't want to hear the word brazier in a song. But how often have, have you taken something that you like for granted? I mean, when you take it for granted, it's there, you always you like it. But how many times have you called up a television station or written to a film company and said, I really like this, this is good stuff? Well, you'd be surprised. I've actually done that a couple of times. Uh -huh. In fact, one time, uh, there was a television evangelist in Los Angeles. I don't think he's located there, uh, but he's broadcast there. Um, he's on Channel 20. And he's on all the time. He's on 36 hours a day. I can't remember his name. He's got white hair. 
and he sits there and he's real fundamentalist and he's you know real he's hard sell and I I watch these shows a lot all the different ones and um, I listened to him for one night for about two hours and I thought he was brilliant and I called up and I said so you know, yes. because what he was talking about at that time he, to me, he sounded like one of the smartest lawyers I've ever seen in my life. As long as he was talking about something that was realistic, you know, other than his monetary pitch for his organization, I could definitely be enthusiastic about what he was doing. And I called up and said so. You see, most people don't do that. Yeah, but they should. You know, if you see something that you like, you should uh, push it. You should, you know, uh, let the people who have invested the money in the phenomenon know that their money was well spent so they'll keep spending it on that and not shift the money to some other project mm -hmm. what makes you really angry the thing that makes me really angry is the exaltation of ignorance that really makes me mad mm -hmm. you know I, I was telling another person a little while ago uh, that people have thought that hydrogen was the basic building block of the universe because it's so prevalent but I believe that the basic building block of the universe is stupidity now stupidity has a lot of charm to it but ignorance doesn't isn't ignorance bliss no I wouldn't say so never having been truly ignorant I couldn't <laughs> tell you about really a know. blissful state <laughs> like that and I've observed a lot of other people who are ignorant and I wouldn't say that they were in a state of bliss either they were okay they were having a good time I wouldn't call it bliss why does it make you angry, and what can you do about that anger? How can you change it? Well, I can't change it, you know, but that doesn't keep me from being angry about it. Mm-hmm. And in, which, in what ways are people ignorant, and how should they change? Remember, I said the thing that makes me mad is the exaltation of ignorance. Yes, I understand. You know, when you celebrate ignorance, you know, and make that the national standard. How is it celebrated? It's celebrated in all uh, records that achieve massive airplay on the radio all television sitcoms um, most films and um, most commercials and also in schools how in schools schools train people to be ignorant with style they give you the equipment that you need mm -hmm. to be a functional ignoramus american schools do not equip you to deal with things like logic they don't give you the criteria by which to judge between good and bad in any medium or format and they prepare you to be a usable victim for a military industrial complex that needs manpower as long as you're just smart enough to do a job and just dumb enough to swallow what they feed you you're going to be all right but if you go beyond that you're going to have these grave doubts that give you stomach problems, headaches, make you want to go out and do something else. So I believe that schools mechanically and very specifically try and breed out any hint of creative thought in the kids that are coming up. So what's the alternative for the parent who would agree with you? Well, remember that the school isn't the only place that a child gets educated. If you realize that the schools are doing damage, and I believe this, I believe that schools do a lot of damage to kids, then you should do what you can at home to help give them something to counteract what's happening to them at school. You mean encourage creativity? Encourage them to read things other than what the school gives them. Encourage them to watch things on television other than cartoons because I don't believe that television is all bad and some things that are on are, are very useful. And give them some support. Let them feel that you as a parent uh, want them to be smart, not just to be successful, not just to be a, a nice little person, that you want them to develop their thinking apparatus. Do you do that with your kids? Sure. What kind of schools do your children go to? They go to a private school. A private school. Yeah. They but used they... to go to a public school before they started busing in Los Angeles. I took them out as soon as the busing started. You're against busing? Absolutely. I don't believe that it's it's not right. It doesn't work. It was. It will never do the job that it was supposed to do. And basically, it's a way for the people who own those horrible little buses to make money. All right, so they're in private schools. What kind of private schools? Because private schools... I mean, can cover a range of different kinds of institutions. It's, it's, progressive it's, kind of school? It's progressive academic kind of school where they learn... Open classroom? 
I don't know what that means. It was open well, class. Uh, children progress at their own speed in different areas. I don't think it's that way at the school. It's it's pretty structured. Mm-hmm. And do you think children should have structure? Yes. Discipline? Sir. Yes. You a disciplinarian? Yes. Hard disciplinarian? Well, I'm not mean, but I think that unless a person comes in contact with some form of discipline, learns how it works, and can then discipline themselves, they're going to be in a lot of trouble when they finally go out into the real world. Mm -hmm. like the best way is to be able to discipline yourself, but if, you, if nobody sets an example for you, then you won't know what discipline is, and somebody will always have to inflict it on you from elsewhere. It'll be your foreman, it'll be your boss somewhere. They'll have to keep banging you over the head to make you do something. Whereas if you learn what discipline means, you learn that you have to do things on time, it's, certain things just have to be done. You learn that, then you do it yourself and you have less conflict with the rest of your environment. How do you enforce it? Well, the same way that um, you would train a dog, you know. Well, do you roll up a newspaper and swat them one on the nose? And if they do something on the rug, you rub their <laughs> nose in it, right. No, seriously, do you spank? Um, I don't think I've ever hit my kids more than once or twice. Mm -hmm. uh, usually I just grouch at them. Do you uh, take things away from them, like no television? You go to your oh, room I and tell them, you can I tell them that they can go to the room. I tell them that uh, they can't have their friends over. Sometimes I tell them they can't watch television. I don't think they really care about that. Mm -hmm. But uh, usually tell them that they can't go to their friend's house or they can't have other friends over. In many ways, you are... Um Certainly, I can't call you conservative, I uh, and would never do that, but in many ways, you are reflecting conservative points of view as far as raising your children, as far as uh, the, the way you discipline them. Uh, yeah, I want to find out how you... There's wrong with that, though. I mean, right. you know, like, just, just because I'm in, in the rock and roll industry, okay, right. uh, I have certain views that I think are traditional, whether you call them conservative or whatever. That's just the way traditional, I, yes. yeah, that that's would the way be I better. feel about it. To today, conservative has turned into a really disgusting word because all the different kinds of people who claim to be conservative aren't really. They're fanatic. They're not conservative. They're fanatic. Let me stop you right there because I know that this is something you feel very strongly about also. So let's continue that thought. Um, but we'll break away for a commercial first and we'll come right back to where we left off. Okay. All right? Stay with us. We'll be right back with the rest of the conversation. We're talking about uh, being traditional, about Frank Zappa being traditional, and I had used the word conservative originally. Uh, pick up on the conversation you're feeling about the word conservative and how the definition of it has changed or what it means now as compared to what it meant uh, when you were a kid growing up. Well, I didn't pay any attention to the word when I was a kid growing up. I mean, I was interested in gunpowder and stuff, you know. But, uh, Certainly not real conservative. <laughs> <or maybe it's laughs> well, that's, that's con gunpowder is pretty conservative these days. The, uh, the way the word is being used today is real wrong because most of the people who are screaming that they're conservative are really just fanatics. And this moral majority religious syndrome, not just to single out the moral majority as one entity, but it is the one that people normally look at. There are a lot of other ones, a lot of other companies in the television religious business that are functioning today, today that claim to be conservative, but are really fanatic. They're as fanatic as the Muslim sects that are causing all the problems in the Middle East. They're dangerous and they're wrong. But in this kind of, see, that's your opinion, all right? And you have stated it. That's right. Okay. You have the freedom in this country to state your opinion. Mm -hmm. But And I hope I continue to have that freedom. And that's why I would not like to see them continue in the direction that they're going. But you take away their freedom. I'm not taking away their freedom. I'm saying that they are wrong in what they're desiring to do. When they say that, the only way that you can be a righteous person is to do it by their book, then that's wrong. My recollection of when I was going to school is the Constitution says there's a church and there's a state and they shouldn't mess with each other. And if they do, then that's against the law, ain't it? Is that the way it goes? All right, when you have a president who has been elected by the, with the assistance, very strong assistance, of fundamental religious groups who have put money and electronic technology behind his campaign to put him in there, they're shaking hands pretty good. 
And obviously, now that he's in the White House, he has to help them out because they can cause him a lot of problems for his programs while he's in there. So it's a very dependent deal, the same way as the president is dependent on military and industrial organizations that have supported his, uh, his regime. The, the thing that's bad about letting any kind of religious organization, whether it's fundamentalist, whether it's Jewish, whether it's Catholic, whether it's Hindu, whatever, to get involved in the business of controlling the secular life of the population is that it's got to lead to the same kind of problems that you have in the Middle East. Yeah, I want to pick up on a word that you used in uh, referring to um, the Reagan administration. Instead of using the word administration, you use the word regime. It is a regime. Why do you think it is a regime and not an administration? Because our administration is almost a benevolent word, you know? Let's talk semantically here. Administration kind of is more positive, you know? It sounds like it's getting something done. And a regime is a little bit more iron-fisted type. And that's why I would use that uh, linguistic distinction. And I think that what we, the situation that we have right now is a cartoon president who is an actor. The guy is an actor. Should have, they should have given him an Academy Award and let it go at that. Is that a bad thing to be an actor? Can an actor have a mind? If you are an actor and you want to act, go do it. If you're an actor and you want to be the president of the United States, have something going for you more than your acting ability. I don't believe he has the intellectual substance to back up what he says because his lines are manufactured for him. He is surrounded by people who feed him information, not all of it good, in fact, most of it bad. And he sits there and acts it out. He's reading the teleprompter. He's a teleprompter president. You take that support team away from him, he's hollow. He's got nothing going for him. He's a smiling, nice guy. He's a nice cowboy guy. Mm -hmm. All right? This is is this what would, we deserve? What if people would say of Frank Zappa, he's a musician. Um, how dare he think that he can make these kinds of statements and get away with it? You know, just as you have just said, Ronald Reagan is an actor, he should have stayed there. What if people would say Frank Zappa is a, a musician and he should just stick to his music? I am sticking to my music. So there's no problem there. But as far but you're as you're also being, speaking out on your feelings. Well, you asked me. I didn't come over here and bang you over the head. <laughs> but in the case of Ronald Reagan, you know, I think that it goes beyond. It's not me criticizing actors as a species and saying you may never rise above the acting profession mm -hmm. and you may never go on. You know, if you're an actor and you are, and you know something about foreign policy and you know something about economics and you know something about the military and you know something about something other than being phony which is what actors get paid to do, to pretend, okay? Mm -hmm. If you are equipped, go be the president. I don't think he's equipped. The only thing he's got is friends in high places, friends with money, and people who feed him stuff to say. I mean, let's be honest about it. And a lot of people don't share those views. Though, they're you. wrong. <laughs> That's my view. I think they're <laughs> wrong. They're being duped. You know, the emperor is not wearing any clothes. The guy's got nothing to offer. He waves, he smiles nice. He's a nice guy, okay? Mm -hmm. I don't hate him. I just think he's not equipped to be the president. He was elected by 17% of the population in, a, in an election where the people were offered a choice between Tweedledum and Tweedledee, you know, and Tweedledee got it. Obviously, you feel strongly about this, though, because it's something that you like to talk about. I mean, you, even though, yes, you I were invited and I asked you the question, uh, you have definite opinions on it. Sure. I have opinions about it because I think about it every day. It's impossible to watch the daily news, which I watch a lot of. I try and check up on what's going on in the world. And it's impossible to watch the news without having some kind of gut reaction to what's going on. And when I see the pathetic solutions that are being offered by this regime to the problems facing the, the United States, economic and otherwise, I, I get very angry because they're the wrong solutions. You know how to solve the economic crisis? Tax the churches. Tax the churches and all the businesses that they own and tax them all the way back to their inception. They should pay their fair share of what it costs to run the country. You tax the churches, you won't have to take the food off the dish of the school lunches. There's plenty of money there. They're making plenty of money. Tax them. 
Nobody in government is going to stand up and say that, and it's the most common sense solution to the economic problem. There's plenty of money owed by those organizations who claim to be religious and who are actually in the real estate business, they're in the supermarket business, they're in the chocolate business, they're, they're in a lot of businesses above and beyond helping people to get to heaven. Mm -hmm. And these are all very temporal uh, businesses, and they should be taxed the same as the guy who owns a gas station. We have to break away again. Uh, when we, I know that uh, you were raised Catholic. I want to find out exactly where you are as far as religion, organized religion is, when we come back. Can we do that? Sure. Okay. We'll be right back. Raised Catholic, uh, do you belong to any organized religion now? No, I don't pay dues to any organized religious organization. Uh, would you consider yourself a religious person? Absolutely. And and how do you show that within your life? I mean, it's not a matter of showing it to anybody. I don't think that by showing your religious beliefs to anybody that makes you a religious person. And how do you live it? I live it through my music and I live it through the way that I conduct my business. What about the way you uh, conduct yourself with other human beings? Do you feel a responsibility to other human beings be because of the way you handle your own religion? Of course. And what is that? Well, as an employer, I am responsible for the well-being of the people who work for me, and I take that responsibility seriously. As an entertainer, I'm responsible for delivering the best of what I can do to the audience that has bought a ticket to see it or buys a record to hear it. Mm -hmm. I have, you know, I have a feeling of responsibility. I take it seriously, and I act accordingly. And what about your friends, your neighbors, your family? Well, I don't have any friends, and uh, my neighbor is a urologist. You don't have any friends? No, I only have, uh, when, when you're the boss, mm -hmm. you don't have any friends. Well, what about people outside the business, or? I don't, I don't have any time for social activities. Mm-hmm. Then who would be your friend? Well, I have a wonderful wife and four children. I like them. They're my friends. So your wife is your friend? Right. Do you think that's important for a relationship? Well, if you're not friendly, it's not going to be too fun to live together. But there's a difference somebody. between being friendly and being in love with someone and having that same someone be your friend. Oh, yeah, true. Friendship is a very important dimension, and I think that a marriage without friendship has got to be pretty dreadful. Mm-hmm. Do you, when you're not working, do you just sort of cut yourself off from the rest of the world and, and you're with your family? Well, when I'm not touring, I'm at home. I, I live in Los Angeles, but I don't go out in Los Angeles because it's a very horrible place. Then and why do you live there? For if my you, business. Oh, for your business. And um, I just stay home. I have a studio in my house. I do my recording there. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's it. And when I'm done doing that part of my work, I go off on the road, and travel around, and do this kind of stuff. I know you're very anti-drug, drugs of any kind. Right. Uh, how did that start? Um, well, I was just never very enthusiastic about um, drugs or drug culture. And uh, I saw what it had done to a lot of people, musicians that I'd worked with, the ways that it affected their lives. I saw, well, since I've been touring for about 16 years, I've had a chance to watch the results of several different phases of popular chemical alteration on the audience as we play. You know, every once in a while a different drug goes on the charts mm -hmm. and everybody uses it and it affects the consciousness of the whole segment of the population. I remember once being at a concert, it was a Rod Stewart concert and it was uh, in Chicago. And uh, I remember walking in there and being so overwhelmed by the odor of marijuana mm -hmm. that, uh, that I, cu I couldn't breathe. Yeah, that's pretty stick. By the odor of marijuana mm -hmm. that, uh, that I, cu I couldn't breathe. Yeah, that's pretty stick. Is it like that at your here. concerts? No. Sometimes uh, you smell a lot of marijuana, but... Do you say anything the... to the audience about, uh, about drugs during your, during your show? Oh, there's one or two songs that we do that are against drugs. We have one song called Cocaine Decisions, which talks about um, uh, cocaine usage among lawyers, doctors, and um, movie people. Mm -hmm. and 
what the net result of that is. But I don't give them a lecture on stage. A lot of times kids will try and hand me a joint and I just throw them, throw them away. Mm -hmm. So you're against all drugs though, cocaine, marijuana, yeah. alcohol? Uh, well, I, I make a distinction um, with alcohol. I'm not a big drinker myself. But um, the thing about drugs is being controlled substances and with specific laws that put you in jail if you've got it, it makes you a criminal when you use it, you know, which gives the government another different type of leverage over you. If they catch you, they got that extra little zinger that they can use on mm -hmm. you, you know. It just puts your freedom in jeopardy aside from what it does to your health and what it does to your mind. I believe the government likes to have drugs in the marketplace because it keeps the population in a very usable state. You really believe there's some yes. sort of conspiracy? Absolutely. There's no question in my mind that if you follow the pyramid right up to the top, that there's no difference between the people who are importing it and the people who are arresting you for using it. What makes you feel that? Um, would it, does it sound far-fetched to to uh, talk about uh, using an entire American community for chemical or biological warfare testing? Well, well would not, you ever, not would anymore. You, it's, it well, doesn't sound far-fetched anymore. Well, you know that it's been done. Our own government has decided to use certain American cities to test chemical warfare agents and, and biological warfare agents on American citizens without their knowledge just decided to do it because the time was right and the area was right and they did it. And you only find out about it 10, 15 years later, okay? Uh, if, if the government can do that to their people, there's no reason to believe that they're above giving them drugs and collecting money for those drugs being used and having the benefit of the stupefaction of the population as a something thrown in along with it. Except there are a lot of people who feel the same way you do, so they're, they're not going to fall into that plan anyway, if, if indeed your plan would be correct. Let me tell you something. I get asked about drugs so many times, most times when I do an interview, they always ask me about drugs, and the reason they do is because I'm such an anachronism. I'm probably the last person in, in the United States who doesn't like them and doesn't use them. I mean, you know, you, maybe you're a, uh, a person who doesn't use them. I don't know. I just don't enjoy them, and I don't like what they do to people. I think there are a lot of people, though, that feel the same way you do. I mean that sincerely. They're definitely the minority because today doctors get wasted you know they go out and snort cocaine before they do open heart surgery it's cool oh, i hope you know. not <laughs> or i hope i never get that your, your we lawyer have to gets it. wasted we have to break away they're getting wasted more. in there look at them but we've been talking about a lot of things that make you angry and a lot of things a lot of areas where you are very pessimistic uh, when we come back i want to find out if there are any areas where you are optimistic okay sure. all right we'll be back right after this what makes Frank Zappa happy? I, I find out what makes you angry. I find out uh, the things that you don't like about this country or the world or anything else. But what do you like? Where do you have some hope? Optimism. Well, I don't have uh, that much optimism, but th there's a difference between having optimism and having things that you like. True. Um, I like good food when I can find it, but it's getting very difficult to find it. You certainly couldn't tell by your weight that you like good food. <laughs> well, I've been sick. Have you? Yes, I've been. Uh, I've had uh, gastroenteritis for about the last uh, eight or nine days, so I've been living on soup and other nasty things like that so but you're feeling better now yeah i'm recovering you won't catch it it's all right i'll breathe <laughs> no i wasn't afraid of that but you're very very thin and normally people who like food uh, are not very very thin well i like it but i'm not going to just eat anything because it's so hard to find stuff that really is prepared well in other words good ingredients put together uh, with the proper amount of time by somebody who knows the formula who loves to cook and instills in the food their own joy of cooking you know, mm -hmm. so that the finished result is something beautiful to eat and that's hard to find you know True. you can get a good hamburger someplace but you know good food hard to find but i like what else makes me happy when i find it i like good musical performances of anything and any kind of music any kind of music anytime um i hear uh, musicians doing their job right i feel good mm -hmm. and this is also not something that happens all the time i mean not Musicians yes. don't always perform up to their maximum capability. Um, 
What else? I like to smoke cigarettes, and I like to drink coffee, and I like sex. And <laughs> other than that, Sounds if, I, American. if I find an honest politician someplace, I might get a laugh out of that. I've uh, seen a couple of people uh, on television who I thought said things that were admirable, and I m mentioned one to you, I said I like John Glenn, and I was even enthusiastic about Barry Goldwater when he was uh, you know, doing his little number about the moral majority, which I thought was very courageous of him. Mm -hmm. Even though I couldn't agree with him on everything else that he says, I could appreciate that. And in fact, even went so far as to invite him to our concert when we were in Arizona. But was he able to come? No, he was, uh, I think he was at a ham radio convention that night. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you see, I, I, when somebody does something that I think is positive, I tell them, I let them know. Yes. What about uh, your kids? What well, about their love future? Them. Yes, I know you love them. What about their future? What do you hope for them? Well, it seems that my daughter has decided to learn to play the drums. I hope that she keeps up with that because I think that a good girl drummer would be nice. Mm hmm. And uh, my, one of my sons was interested in baseball. He got to be very good at that. And now he's decided to play the guitar. And I would kind of like to have him be a musician if he... You would. Yeah. Sometimes parents don't want their kids to follow in their footsteps because they found, uh, they found it difficult. They don't want their kids to go through those same kind of difficulties. Well, I wouldn't want them to go through the same kind of difficulties either, but what's that got to do with being a guitar player? You know? <laughs> yes. It's just the joy of being able to plug it in, turn it up and go mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm. you know? He should have that, uh, that fun in his life if he wants it. We're going to have to continue this conversation another time. The time has just flown by and we are completely out of time. I thank you very much, Frank Zappa, for being my guest Thanks this evening. Thanks for letting me come on the show. All right. And thank you for being with us. Good night.